Firewoods Conservation Commission on May 10th, Wednesday, May 10th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the John B. Griffin Room. This is still a hybrid meeting. Those who are interested <coughs> in participating um, online in the meeting can find login directions if you don't already have them on the um, on the agenda on the Harwich Conservation Department webpage. So our first item on the agenda tonight is for a request for a determination of applicability at 2071 Route 28, Head of the Bay Road, Map 109, parcel R1-B improvements to the front entrance and front terrace and base removal and mitigation planning. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Shannon Goheen, Second Nature Garden Works, representing the Romans tonight, and there are two of them, at least two of them, on the Zoom there. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the property. I'm, I'm presuming that some of you, if not all of you, saw it. Um, <clears throat> it's in a very unique situation where it's bordering two freshwater wetlands and Pleasant Bay. And, of course, the house is in the only upland and stretches across it. And you've seen that really everything has been disturbed in one way or another, the, where the house is and around the house, the landscape. Disturbed in terms of it's no longer native. So uh, the family uses it lightly, I would say. There, there are a lot of them. Um, and they, they use the place a lot, but they use the land rather lightly. Um, you will have noticed that the grass wasn't perfect. It's not a, a treated golf course perfect lawn. Um, and that's not important to them. So there are things that need to be done here uh, that you've seen in your packet. And I think that our situation is to honor the property as best we can. We can't put it back. And um, what, what they want to do and what I am helping them do, along with uh, Lindsay Strode, who's the landscaper on this, um, is, is to try to make it better, try to honor where it is and make the improvements that they need as a family and make it better than it was. So the, the issues at hand are the first one is the main thing that got us here is that the front foundation is cracked and leaking and in order to fix that they need to pull the terrace the existing terrace off and you probably notice the door is a lot higher than the driveway so there needs to be something there so they can get into the house it makes sense to redo the existing terrace within the same footprint where it already is, except that what we're doing is taking the entrance stairs out of the 50-foot zone and moving it further away into the 100. And um, <clears throat> that's, that's our main issue. Uh, it's an old driveway. It's paved. And we suspect that with construction equipment, the driveway may crumble a bit, might crack some more. And so it seemed pertinent to ask for permission to redo the driveway if that occurs. A very small issue is there are some bittersweet vines, as they are anywhere. Um, there are some bittersweet vines on the slope between the driveway and the wetland that is uh, between the house and Route 28. Um, and Amy suggested that we ask for permission to pull them out. It's very, very steep, and we might as well get them now while they're small. 
Another issue is down uh, the lower part of the house. There is, you would have seen some stone steppers just kind of going that way into a lower entrance of the house down by the garage. And we would like to make that a little more accessible. The family spends a lot of time there when the kids play basketball and whatever. And right now there is no place to sit except some ratty grass. And so we thought perhaps we could expand it ever so slightly and make a nice draining little <coughs> patio area where they could sit. And then the last issue is that there is a deck all along the water side. It's a wooden deck. And it has a lot of rotted pieces in it. And they have asked, may we please replace the rotted wood so people don't fall through it. There are no plans to expand the deck or alter it in any way, only to make it safe. <clears throat> Is there anything else I can tell you about it? Well, there may be questions, but first, Amy, do you want to give your you can, summary? You can please? tell us about your wonderful plantings. I like to use native plants as if they are, I like to make native plantings pretty. So I'm not nature, I'm not God, I can't do uh, what nature does with natives. So I use natives and um, organize them in ways that I think are pleasant for people to look at. And I think that helps foster appreciation for natives rather than just kind of a bloop, you know, bloop, put natives here, put them there, which we know is not necessarily attractive in all situations. So <coughs> what I have done from here all the way down, this is the garage all the way to the entrance where you come into the house, is use native plants and uh, they're low, most of them are very low. So that we want to avoid over time a lot of pruning and fuss and that sort of thing. So um, we've chosen low things like lavenders, potentillas, father gilla, dwarf oak leaf hydrangea. Um, we've got a little switchgrass in there, bearberry, summer sweet, the usual things that you hear about and um, they're just arranged in a way that I think will be very pleasant for everybody and uh, will really, really uh, beef this up in a very big way for pollinators and birds and all the critters that like this sort of thing. Because right now, none of that exists in that front foundation. So we would like the whole thing to be really lovely and useful and responsible. Thank you. Okay. So to the technical aspects, um, you have largely, uh, you have a slight increase in your zero to yeah. 50 foot buffer, and that's largely because your ex the existing terrace has some perviousness to it, if you will. They have, and the new terrace um, will not and it has a dry well to take care of the water so we don't have foundational problems anymore. Um, but the current terrace, when you walk up the stairs, there's an exterior wall, and then there's kind of this gap of, and it's some mostly ornamental and um, actually herb type planting from what, I, from what I saw in there. And then in the middle of that, you have your actual like patio. So. Shannon had to kind of take that what is interstitial space right now and account for that. Um, so there's a slight increase in the zero to 50, but it's not because the terrace itself is expanding. Um, it's just to kind of fill in the spaces there. Um, and then the porous patio, as you go down the driveway towards the um, garage, that configuration has changed a little bit as well, but this is all on the opposite side of the wetland from the existing driveway. So there was um, some mitigation that needed to be done. The total square footage required was about two, was about 513 square feet. 
Um, the mitigation, the, the plantings that Shannon described, the foundation the plantings will certainly assist with diversity and habitat and be low maintenance, be great for pollinators. Um, in my mind, and it's a wonderful addition, um, but the, what I would consider true mitigation, because how the commission views mitigation, is taking what is existing lawn area up on the northern part of the property and converting that to native. And that is, there's a contiguous, it's contiguous from there all the way down to the freshwater wetland there. It's just, it's increasing the natural area there and that area is greater than the 512 or 13 square feet, which combined with this other plantings here is about 2,000 square feet. This is a nice variety up here of higher shrubs, um, trees, and whatnot, and is our would be would do very well in this area. So, um, a variance has been requested um, for work in the zero to fifty. I think this will result in a net improvement in the site. Specifically, if you redo the driveway, that it's pitched not towards the wetland. Um, potentially install some drains there as well in the driveway as it is quite a, it's a large stretch of driveway and I'm sure the owners don't want any pooling or ponding at anywhere near the house. Um, but overall I, I see this as a, as a net improvement to the property and I would recommend approval with a negative three determination. Thank you. Let's uh, have comments, questions. I, it looks good to me. I don't have any comments on it. So, yeah, just two questions. Um, in replacing the uh, the problem boards in the deck, are you just going to replace the boards that have a problem, or are you going to replace the whole deck? It's my understanding that it's only the boards with a problem. Okay, so just you can check with the Romans. Okay, right here. you would please. You there, Andrea? Yeah. I Andrea Roman, uh, we have some of the posts also need to be replaced. They're rotted and um, for the railing for the railings. So it would be a combination. Okay, so it's not a complete deck replacement. It's just replacing what's rotted away. Yeah. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. My other question is, if you do have to replace the driveway. Have you considered replacing it with some type of uh, porous material? We didn't. I took the advice of Lindsay Strode, who uh, we looked at it together, and um, he did not suggest that. It's a really large driveway. Um, he did suggest extra drainage points, which he was going to look into, because right now there's only one drain at the very bottom of okay. it. And um, that should be checked, probably improved. And he suggested another one across from the proposed entrance to the house, where it's and, another low spot. And where would those drains drain to? I'm not sure. I don't understand drain construction. Okay, well, it, and not it, into the wetlands. Not into the wetlands. That was my understanding that the water was not going to go directly into the wetlands. Okay, because you don't really have that much room in that area from what yeah. I saw. Th that's, that's a technical wells, question. Dry wells. Yeah, could know. it go into dry wells? It might, that might have been what he was talking about. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Go ahead. I've got a few, um, one quick one for Amy. Um, it seems the level of activity in the zero to 50 might um, have this as a module case for notice of intent. What was your thoughts on what separated this from an RDA and a notice of intent? My thoughts were that there was a lot, there was a whole drive, per, uh, paved driveway closer to the resource area, and the majority of this is removal and pretty much exact replacement. There is, you know, there's a little bit of new structure, but um, I thought this was something that needed only moderate conditions. Um, and that essentially was a replacement. Mm -hmm. yep. it's, 
seem to me on the margin, but mm -hmm. there's, there's criteria behind it. Um, second question, the, the deck terrace, um, how, are they okay with pass permitting and certificates of compliance? Are they uh, complying? Mm -hmm. They are, no yep. problems there. We checked on that. Yep, and the next and last question is on um, that southern plantings. Um, to me, well, first of all, what percentage of the proposed mitigation is comprised from that southern area? It sounds like the northern area meets the 515. Do you mean this? Yeah. Yes. This, this is actually represented in that box. That's so this southern region yeah. is this 1,957 square feet. Oh, yeah, you're right. And you did call out yeah, mitigation it separately. Yep. So it's actually about 2,500 square feet of planting. Yeah, I did not include the upper portion. Thank okay. you. Okay, because to me, it's, it's very ornamental. I, I wouldn't consider this straight up mitigation as I think Amy described as well, whereas that northern section of approaches mitigation in my mind. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, is there any need or is there any potential to have some of those plants that are up north be brought down and expanded in the zero to 50. There's a little edge there in the zero to 50 that has a lot of the so to well, get some more wetland plants in that area. It's not wet. It's well, not I, wet in that area. I know, it's, it's very still dry. zero to 50. Well, we'd have to water it though, you know, consistently to keep it alive if, if it was some wetland type plant. A lot of the ones that are in that more, what you, you know, looks like a formalized bed, the majority of those are native. Well, I know. I, I know they're native and they're, they're beautiful. Yeah. But I, at the same time, that I don't view them as mitigation, whereas if they were wetlands plants or some type of plants like you saw further up, um, then I think it would be more um, habitat providing in terms of you know, native uses. So that's, that's what I'm interested in. Um, I don't know if in terms of mitigation or not. Um, they meet, their numbers meet the mitigation requirement of the 513 that they have, that up there on the north meets that. That's over? That is over that. Where's that number in that, I, that box? It is on the bottom, very bottom line in that mitigation calculations. Where's what number? Did I get for, that for right? The, uh, for this area up here, what I'm saying is the northern section. But what's the square footage on that? I didn't include it, so I can't tell you. I based sitting. it on the typical diameter of most of these plantings. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the number here in front of me, Brad, but it, yeah. it was over. Taking the number of those plants by their, their basic diameter. Well, that would be my request, is, is I'm just looking for the, in, within the zero to 50 to maybe replace some of those ornamentals with more functional habitat for roosting plants. There are windows all along the front of that house that are very, yeah, pretty close to the ground. And if we were to fill it with blueberries, say, um, then we'd block them. It'd be dark inside. And, uh, same with viburnums. Yeah. Sweet fern. You know, a, a sweet fern looks good where it's neglected. Um, anywhere else, it tends to be splotchy and pretty unattractive, mm -hmm. all by itself. So, um, this is the balance I, I try to try to walk, where something where people are actually going to be. Um, and where the house windows risk being blocked, you know, I think lower plants are more appropriate. Well, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm just saying this was my thought process. Mm -hmm. Is that lower plants are more appropriate for that area to let the light in? Mm -hmm. um, and then in the, the more wild area, you know, go with the big stuff which is how we get the blueberries and the witch hazel and the viburnums and tupelos. Mr. Chairman, can I make a quick comment? Please do. Um, I'm not arguing for or, or against the applicant. I'm just saying in general, when I look at this as a person who 
over the past many years has um, taken a great interest in doing um, native plantings and native plant design. I would argue that this, what they have proposed, is actually much better for habitat as well as increasing diversity. And it is, there are some ornamentals, but it is um, mostly native. And yes, they are low natives. Um, but in terms of for pollinators, for birds, for producing fruit and pollen, that what is proposed um, is good um, uh, if you wanted to view it as mitigation or not, but is a good addition to this project. And I didn't suggest that they go with the higher natives such as they did up there. One, because I was viewing that as the, the actual real mitigation piece, but here wasn't looking at like visual, what it was going to look like visually for looking out there, but I said, it's across, the, you know, it's across the resource from, it's across the driveway from the resource. So there's really no habitat connectivity there. So in my mind, this, when I, when I suggest, guided them on this process, I um, looked favorably upon this plan. But take that as you will. No, thanks, Amy. That, that's good to clarify that. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I just, um, you know, the project is asking for a variance. And so um, that's to allow new material in the 0 to 50. So I guess that's just my preference, is um, to, to not see um, those ornamental plants in the 0 to 50. So I, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you, Stan. There is no place on this property, really, where you can store anything that isn't within a resource area. And, um, you know, if, if you go further south, you're 50 feet from that wetland. Um, and that's how they access the water. And on the other side, where the boats are, you know, they're in between the what is it? I don't have it labeled on this plan. They're in between the 100 foot from the wetland and they're in between the 50 foot from the top of the coastal bank. So, I mean, they're just kind of stuck in every direction. And um, the outdoor shower what? is over there on the north side where the cluster of boats is now. Um, Actually, the homeowners want to speak? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Just want to make a point that there's an unusual amount of boats that you probably would have seen if you were there just this past week. Right. We've had our entire basement renovated, and we usually keep the boats in the garages and the basement. Um, and they're usually not there on that side yard. Okay. That's, help. That's very helpful. We do um, store a dock up the hill from the landing area that goes down into the water. Yep. And uh, that would like to continue. That is an approved location that we have in a previous order of conditions for your dock, so that was fine. We've been getting a, a great deal of work done on the house because uh, I think it, the house was built actually in 1946 and uh, it had some old wiring and so we've completely rewired the this whole, that whole section of the house, <laughs> plugs and all, and uh, yeah, and now the foundation's next. <laughs> so just as a note about that, one of those boats was not turned over. It's full of water, getting ready to breed mosquitoes. You might turn it over, and so that it doesn't collect water. Well, I agree with that. I was there by myself this week and thought the same thing, but I wasn't strong enough to turn it over. So <laughs> somehow it blew over in the winter. Yeah. But yeah, it would be pretty cleared up in the next month. I don't okay. have any other Thank questions. you. Sophia. Um, well, I think I kind of agreed with Brad on the plants, um, but I 
I kind of hate to be a stickler about it because obviously lavender and caryopteras are great for pollinators and probably a pretty low chance of becoming invasive or I have a hard time keeping bluebeard alive. So, um, but I do think if one is like lucky enough to have most of their property be, or all of it be within the 100 and part of it within the 50, I do think it really should be all natives. And I don't think there's a whole lot of love loss for um, pollinators. I think that I, I guess I would like to see the few things that aren't native swapped out and maybe, you know, a few more sweet ferns in, in this kind of wild buffer. Um, and, you know, there's some low bush blueberry um, that could be used that wouldn't block the windows. And um, that would be, that would be my only thing. It's so, it's so close that in this case, I really feel like it should be um, all native. I'll set. I just have one comment or question just on that same topic. Um, there's a non-lawn on the north end of the house, as you already observed, and there's not much going on there aside from storing boats, and I guess you said there's a shower, but there's an op. Why wouldn't you be planting a few more natives up there, maybe near where the north end of the deck is and in there, which is inside the 50, which would satisfy what Brad and Sophia are talking about without, I mean, it's not like you'd have to tear up a bunch of beautiful lawn there, fortunately. So, I mean, and I don't know if there are windows there. I didn't notice whether there would, somebody's view would be obstructed by putting in something like high bush blueberries, but why wouldn't you do that? Is there? Are you suggesting Thickening the area that I've already drawn. Is that I said more directly of it? on the north end of the house. Oh, actually, in the but, against yeah. the foundation. Yeah, foundation like planning on the north side. Maybe there's no sun. Maybe that's a problem, a sun problem. But it's just a suggestion, an observation. I don't know. So. Um, is there any public comment here from anyone in the room or online? Any further discussion outside of the commission? So what's the commission's feeling about how to proceed here? I guess coming in, I didn't know you know, how much of the mitigation requirement was satisfied by that northern section. So that, that's where my questions came from. If there is any reasonable way to augment that section, uh, but maybe it's not necessary. So, uh, but I, I kind of agree with your thoughts, John, although I, I would probably put the material to thicken what's being proposed as opposed mm -hmm. to putting it along the house. Mm -hmm. That would be my preference, but um, I, I'm just not certain given the mitigation requirements, how hard to push on this. So I <clears throat> well, can I suggest that what we might do is approve this tonight with a condition that some additional plantings be done under the supervision of the conservation agent in that section of... Up on the top? Up on the top. Yeah, I think you could. Um, I think addition of additional sweet fern to kind of bridge the gap between your two sweet fern areas would be um, a good idea. If you can do that in front of the high bush blueberry, if the commission and the if everyone's in agreement about that, that's what I would recommend. Um, I'm fine with. Works for me. That's what you want to do. Any further comment? Would someone like to make a motion? <coughs> sure. Quick, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Sure. Yeah, no. did, did Sophia have any specific species in that zero to 50 that you thought um, could be substituted? I did, yep. The, the blueberries, the caryopteris, and the lavender. Um, Low bush blueberry? No, the. Oh. 
Bluebeard, so the Caryopteris. Oh, Bluebeard, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you said Blueberry. And that's, where are you suggesting that would happen? I, I'm suggesting that those don't, those don't have a place in this planting okay. and instead to thicken the, that I see. Okay. buffer in the north. Okay. Um, I would like to move that we approve the request for a determination of applicability with a negative three determination under the condition that some additional planting on the north side of the property be included in consultation with the conservation agent and that we authorize the variance for work within the zero to 50 foot buffer. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Six and zero. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is a notice of intent for 2026 Route 28, Head of the Bay Road, Map 99, Parcel B1, remove previously cut and damaged trees and invasive vegetation in a view corridor and replace with native trees and shrubs that will not require pruning in the future. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to recuse myself. Okay, thank you. I'll come get you. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, Teresa Sprague with Blue Blacks Design here on behalf of the applicant, Peter Chapman, who is in room um, with us this evening, feeling a little shy, doesn't want to come up to the table, <laughs> but will be available to answer questions. Um, and the property owners, um, Sharon Hayes and Jonathan Vaughn. So I, I believe you're all familiar with this um, property. Uh, we have been before you before for both properties. Um, we do have an open uh, note, uh, order of conditions for 265 Bay Road. We have removed some invasive vegetation and previously cut oaks and cherries on that property and are restoring native vegetation. So we're coming before you um, to address the area that we had a uh, approval through a request for determination of applicability in 2021 to manage through VISTA pruning at that time, knowing that we were going to be coming before you um, again with a notice of intent filing to um, bring before you a management plan that provides a, more, a better long-term solution for the management of this area. So there is um, a view easement on this property um, as shown on plans by East South East, South East LLC. Um, Thad Eldridge, and I've um, written the language in the project narrative from the document um, regarding that particular easement. So there is a view easement that was granted to um, the property owners of 265 Bay Road over um, 2026 um, Route 28. And it's quite an extensive easement, um, as you can see from the plans, but only a small portion of that has actually been actively managed over mo many, many years now. Um, the existing oak and cherry trees in those areas have been topped. Um, I, I believe you were all out to visit the site today, and um, I've also included some photographs with the project narrative um, describing what those trees look like. Um, they are truly topped. They are truly um, in very poor condition and very poor health. They really cannot be managed um, any longer in the way they've been current, in the way that they've been managed. So in order to continue to manage the view easement that has been approved in the past, it's really impossible to do that without killing the trees. Um, so what we're proposing to do rather than, um, rather than continue to cut these trees down and eventually lead to their full demise is um, to remove those trees and plant the area with native shrubs um, some lower shrubs, larger shrubs, and trees appropriate to the topography of the site that will not require continued management in order to maintain this historically maintained vista. Um, as I just as an overview, I'd like to just give you um, a little bit of information about the existing conditions. We do have land subject to coastal storm flowage, um, flood elevation 13, as well as a coastal bank per DEP wetlands policy 92.1. The coastal bank here does not act as a sediment source. It's simply a vertical buffer to flood waters. Um, and with that, all associated um, buffer zones um, to that coastal bank. 
Um, we presume the, um, the interests to be storm damage prevention, flood control, protection of wildlife habitat, public and private water supply, protection of groundwater, prevention of pollution, and erosion and sedimentation control. Um, the proposed conditions um, are to um, remove those damaged oak and cherry trees, as well as an, um, a, a fairly extensive area of invasive um, vegetation, including bittersweet, honeysuckle, um, shrub honeysuckle, and other invasive species. Um, and to restore these areas with native vegetation appropriate to site conditions that will support bank stability, provide high wildlife habitat value, and eliminate the need for any disturbance um, in the future to maintain that. Um, we would be proposing to do this by removing those damaged, degraded oak and cherries. Um, with the invasive vegetation, we'd be selectively treating it with an EPA-approved systemic herbicide, and then that vegetation will all be removed by hand. So there'll be no equipment or no mechanical um, removal in that area. After the um, vegetation is managed and removal is completed, the area will be seeded with a mix of cool and warm season grasses and, um, and then will be planted with native trees and shrubs according to the plan. Um, temporary <coughs> irrigation would be required for the first two to three growing seasons and then once the plants are established, all irrigation will be removed from the area. We would recommend selective follow-up invasive species management to be ongoing for the next three growing seasons and monitoring beyond that to ensure that the area is not reinfested. Um, silt vents will be installed in the seaward edge of the project area during vegetation removal and will remain in place until the, um, until the area that's seeded and blanketed is stable. Um, we do expect there to be some, area, some resource area impacts initially um, to that small portion of the coastal bank that we're proposing to manage and within the 50-foot buffer as we remove the degraded vegetation. But once the in area is entirely restored, we do believe that it will be more ecologically sound um, and in far better condition than existing conditions. Um, again, the primary goal is to maintain the existing view corridor, naturalize the edges of that view corridor, restore native woody vegetation that won't require ongoing pruning, there is no expansion of the historically approved to maintain view corridor. And um, again, the, the goal of this plan is to preserve those views, views without future um, management or disturbance in the area. Um, it, we are proposing, we, there are five large cedar trees and one lar large holly that have not previously been cut or pruned. Those will be remaining. In addition to that, we'll be adding seven um, cedar trees, eastern red cedar trees, as well as 209 shrubs in that area. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the proposed plan. Thank you. Amy? Um, just wanted to let the commission know it was the previous owners who mismanaged um, the trees here, not the current owner. Um, so what they want to do is, is kind of set it right. And if you've been to the site, they are, the trees are heavily impacted by the previous pruning. and there really is no other way. I mean, if you were to flush cut them and let them re-sprout, the owner would wanna keep pruning them. Um, the idea, I think, behind this plan is to remove those that are up closer to the top of the embankment, replace with some lower um, native plants, and then as you work your way down the very steep um, high slope, the plants get higher and higher and then um, trees towards the bottom, so replacement with trees. But the idea that um, after they establish, there really should be no need to go in there and prune and disturb. It's a very steep coastal bank. Um, the coastal bank is, as you can see on the plan, quite a ways up on the slope, and this is due to the steep nature of it. You don't have the break in the slope till you get very high up on this property, even though the actual wetland, which is partially Muddy Creek, and on the other side there is another wetland um, far, fairly far away. So the coastal bank comes pretty far up. Um, there is some invasives which would be removed <coughs> in there, and I think going forward this is the correct way to manage this property. Um, I would recommend approval. Thank you, Amy. Brad? None. Mm. 
no comment. Alan. No comment. No comment. <clears throat> Comments either or questions. Um, any discussion from the public? Maybe I should have sat up in the chair. Well, either way, <laughs> you, can. you can sit back there. You just need to go. If we're going to talk, you can please come to a microphone. You're okay. Okay. Well, hearing none. Okay, um, I would like to move that we approve the notice of intent for 2026 Route 28, Head of the Bay Road, Map 99, Parcel V1, uh, with a negative three determination. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's six and all. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. I, I've just never had a, a hearing where I haven't had to answer a question, so I'm a little bit <laughs> dumbfounded, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it your birthday? It's my birthday. So, so happy oh, birthday. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> so next on the agenda is 43 Shore Road, Map 2, Parcel B1-4 for Shorefront protection. Do you need to get set up here? I wonder, is it possible for the, if that's a pan fill, can he look at the plan instead of me? I mean, I'm not shy, but he could look at the plan and it would go up on the screen. I think he just heard the request, so. You can bring a third seat up if you want. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. For the record, I'm Mark Burgess of Shorefront Consulting. Um, representing the McGuire's who are right next to me. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I'm Mohal McGuire. Oh, sorry. I it's, good. it's okay. Vivian, <laughs> Vivian and Dennis. Um, okay, so this project is for shorefront protection. Um, the, the applicants purchased the property on what, December 23rd? 23rd. And a day later, was when they got, they got the storm and their demise, they came down and kind of went, wow. Um, there's plenty of pictures, I'm sure. Has everybody been to the site? Okay, great. All right, so I'm just going to read from my notes. I tried to make them concise, but, but thorough. So the proposed shorefront protection consists of 45 feet of a vinyl bulkhead with a 10-foot return. That's on the east side of the property. And then it transitions to a 78-foot rock revetment with a 17-foot return that wraps around the, um, where the, the access is. Uh, the top of the bulkhead is elevation 12. The top of the revetment is elevation 12. And in this location, the flood zone is a velocity zone, elevation 13. And then landward of the velocity zone is uh, an AE zone of elevation 11. And please remember that the velocity zone of 13 feet allows for two feet of waves above that. The existing stairs are allowed to be reconstructed. At this point in time, they, they're holding up, but uh, a lot of the sauna tubes are exposed and we just don't know how far down they go. So there's, I'm, I put it in here just in case so that if uh, something happens to them, they can be reconstructed in the same footprint. The kayak rack that's on the beach is from the previous owner. That is proposed to be removed. I don't know how it stayed there during the storm in the first place, but it, it's going to leave. Um, the distance from the foundation of the house to the top of bank is now 39 feet. 
The distance from the deck to the top of the bank is now 20 feet at its furthest point and 14 feet at the closest point. The entire revetment is within the footprint of the bank prior to the 1223 storm. And the revetment will not extend further than the existing access path. And there's a special note in the plan. So even the tow stones aren't going to go like under that path. That path won't be, won't be touched. Um, erosion rates. So the coastal zone management erosion rate for this site, there's a transect that goes right through it, is minus 0 0.07 feet per year, which is less than an inch. Now, granted, this data is, is, is dated in, in and of itself, but it's something to go by. For the entire bank slope, that equates to 3.2 cubic yards per year. So the initial nourishment over the revetment will completely bury the revetment and then some, and that's 95 cubic yards. That essentially is 29 years of erosion at the natural rate that's the, of the data that we have. There are two trigger points that will be established at each end of the revetment, one at elevation 5 and one at, at elevation 3. Elevation 5 is one foot higher than the beach was at the time of the January survey. And then obviously elevation 3 is one foot below that. When the beach drops, so this is called a trigger point. I don't know how, how familiar the board is, is with it. Um, we use this on lots of revetment projects, and it's a, it's a, the goal is to mimic the natural erosion rate at a specific area rather than just putting a bunch of sand every year, which could be too much or not enough. Um, so the two trigger points are established. When the beach drops to elevation three, then an additional 50 cubic yards of material is placed over the revetment. That's another 15 years worth for each of that occurrence. Now you place it on the revetment because if you put it on the beach, it goes away right away and it doesn't really do anything. When you place it on the revetment, it filters down through the rocks and it's metered out at a slower rate, which more closely mimics the natural erosion process. Um, and so the idea behind this is the amount of sand, which is well in excess of what would normally come out of that bank, is being used to maintain and increase and, and uh, maintain and increase the beach elevation. Therefore, the revetment itself doesn't have any negative effects to the adjacent beaches, and it could actually improve them because of the excessive <coughs> amounts of nourishment. The bulkhead, the bulkhead is located so that the area where the bank remains will continue to function naturally unless and until it's taken by more storms. Then the bulkhead will come into play because there's nothing in front of it anymore. Um, the access for the project is entirely from the applicant's property. The, the septic system is over, uh, like sort of under the driveway, so they'll access entirely over the applicant's property uh, from the top down. Now this is a relatively short revetment, at least in my world, and uh, I'm, a, I'm pretty certain that an excavator can reach everything, in, including the tow stones, from the top of the bank. If they can't, they'll simply go down to the bottom through the bank, lay the first one or two rows of stones and go back up and do everything from the top. So there's no reason to have a bunch of equipment on the beach for any length of time. Excuse me, for any length of time. Um, Pardon me. And then refer to the alternatives analysis and conformance to the DEP regulations in the narrative. I tried to be very explicit and explain how it, the regulations are in play here. The bank is, is both a vertical buffer and a sediment source, so the nourishment maintains that sediment source so that it meets that performance standard. And Amy can um, d describe more in detail if she needs to. So now the, the last thing is mitigation. Um, if you want to make some notes, the revetment occupies 977 square feet. The bulkhead, which is 45 feet and a 10-foot return, is 500, uh, sorry, 55 square feet. So the total area of, of those uh, elements is 1,025 square feet. So what I did in AutoCAD is I took, I drew what's called a polyline around starting at the seaward side of the bulkhead and the revetment, go all the way around the return, only in the footprint of where the structures are going to be, and carry it back to where the existing lawn is now. That's your existing vegetative buffer that we want to maintain and, and remain in place. 
that is 782 square feet. So even at a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, you'd only need another 240, 243 square feet that could be added on the west side to provide a visual and a sound buffer as well to the people using the access. Um, what we're seeking tonight would be an approval of the project and we would then work with Amy to develop a sketch plan for the mitigation that meets her approval. And as a requirement of the order, that plan must be approved by Amy prior to construction. Uh, this plan would be developed while the project is out to bid, which is absolutely as, as, certain, uh, as soon as possible. Um, the applicant's interested in getting this work done absolutely as soon as possible. Um, so this, I think, is a way to develop the mitigation that we need once we decide tonight on what it might be, and, uh, and then we'll work with Amy and, and, and get it done. If it doesn't meet her approval, then the work doesn't start. And then uh, I've received four or five supporting emails. I think e Amy's got, I got about it. 10. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> um, I probably don't want to read them all into the record, but they basically say they're in full support of the project. And while they might not be able to be present tonight, they're, they're fully in support of. And these are all the, from the neighborhood. I think with that, um, I think you guys want to say something and then. Uh, we'll yeah, I just want to introduce myself to my wife, Vivian. I'm Dennis McGuire. I'm Vivian. McGuire. Um, I have been coming to Howard for my entire life. I won't tell you how many years because I'm old. Uh, my wife's been coming for uh, nearly 30 years. We came over from Gorham Road, purchased the uh, house on Shore Road. We were delighted to be there. We came down Christmas weekend, our family. Uh, we were like renters. We had the car packed with sheets and everything <laughs> else. And there we went. And, you know, we couldn't really go outside on Saturday because of the storm. Sunday, Christmas morning, we went out. And we were all literally about in tears because it was gone. That whole, it was frightening. And uh, since that time, we've just been engaged in trying to push this forward. We appreciate you seeing us early. We'd, we'd love to get this moving, um, simply because the summer, as we all know, is coming. We don't want to impact anyone. And then you got hurricane season following thereafter. So thank you for your time and appreciate it. Mean that. Thank you. Amy. Thank you. Um, before I get to the performance standards, I wanted, we kind of just finished talking about mitigation. So I wanted to hear, I don't know if I quite understood. You said you already have about 700 something square feet of house. How does that work? So the, <coughs> the, uh, the revetment is in front of that. There's a, okay. You might not have seen it or felt it when you're out there, but there's two steel plates. Yeah. And in between that are some plants that are overgrown, mismanaged, or neglected, and all mm -hmm. of that. But basically, between the edge of the lawn mm -hmm. and the and the landward edge of the revetment mm -hmm. and, and the bulkhead, mm -hmm. it's an unmowed natural area that will remain. Oh. So that's an existing vegetative buffer that you have already. We typically would not consider that as a mitigation because you already have it. Okay. So in addition to is what the commission. We can talk about that more. Yep. But you don't get credit for having an undisturbed vegetated strip to begin with. So if you're going to be putting in new structure, I mean, that's what, what conditions you have on the site are there. So it would be in addition to, and I'm more than happy to work with you to generate some, uh, to look at what would, what would work there. Yep. Um, a vegetated, an enhanced vegetated strip is to your benefit as well. Um, it has better root systems, which are going to just further especially at the top of the bank, too, where you can also get some erosion behind revetments due to even heavy rainstorms events. You want something that's really going to take up that excess moisture. So I just wanted to clarify that, that, that unfortunately that 700 square feet of buffer that you currently have would not count as it's not new mitigation. Okay? Um, or at least not how I interpret um, our regulations and how we do things. So. But going to the performance standards for the actual project that you're wishing to do, just to kind of walk the commission through it, um, this is in this location, a coastal bank. Um, there's various locations on Shore Road where it's a mix of dune and coastal bank. This here, there probably once was a dune farther out, vegetated dune, but over the years has completely eroded and certainly now has is gone. Um, 
it could be fill there, but it is certainly not wind or wave sediment that is in that slope. Um, so it is a coastal bank. Um, had it been a dune, a hard solution such as rocks or bulkheads um, would not be something that the commission could consider because we can't allow something that's going to alter the movement of that dune, but you don't have that. So in a way, that's a, a slight benefit. Um, the DEP, when they're looking at revetments and, co and um, bulkheads, looks to see what age the structure or what when a structure was on the site. There was a house here in the 1930s. It's not the current house, but there was a house in approximately somewhere in that, in that location in the 1930s. So DEP would view this, or haven't commented otherwise, um, that this would qualify for them to be able to ask for a hard solution such as what they're proposing here. Um, the previous owner did a little bit of what we would call soft solutions in terms of sand drift fence, a little bit of planting, um, not really sand nourishment. And this is an area that's between two groins and the water just funnels right up into that area. So a soft solution such as continuing um, sand drift fencing or any type of fiber rolls wouldn't work, in my professional opinion, in this area. It's too, too exposed to, to wave action for any type of temporary thing. Um, let's see, what else? Pre-78 structure. Being less than, f so 40 linear feet is kind of the magic number for DEP. I've seen it numerous times. If they consider on an eroding coastal bank, if you are closer, your foundation is closer than 40 feet from an eroding bank, they consider it a critical situation, essentially. Um, they lost, and I, I'll attest to it, I was with um, Mrs. McGuire, I think the day after yeah. Christmas. <laughs> um, and I'm very, very familiar with that beach over the years, so you know, when I look at that flagpole and see that the flagpole is pretty much at the edge of the coastal bank and I knew where it was, was just a few months prior, um, they, they, they truly lost 12 feet in that storm. Um, and that they've seen erosion. I mean, that was a major case, but there's, there's been heightened erosion in this location for a long time. Um, I do think a sand nourishment would be a requirement. Um, I think the initial cubic yardage is appropriate to cover it, and as Mark said, I mean, it's not natural, but it mimics as best as it can the natural sand migration from a bank down to the beach. Um, and I think the benchmarks or whatever, you, I forget what you called them. Trigger but points. Trigger points um, would be a necessity as well. Um, that way you can monitor beach elevation because if your beach keeps getting lower and lower. One neg a negative of these structures is that without nourishment and without the right amount, your beach gets lower and lower and lower, and eventually your toe stones will get exposed. Um, structure becomes compromised. So, you know, you're looking at a long-term investment in this to um, to maintain it and maintain your beach profile. Um, Right underneath the stairs, I was going to mention, I didn't, it's hard to tell from a drawing, but it seems like where the stairs, where the stairs are is the transition between rock and bulkhead. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell from the photo, but I would recommend as a gradual change, maybe even having, because right now you have, it's like rocks, bulkhead. Instead of having a clear delineation, maybe putting tapering those rock down underneath the stairs, um, so there's not too abrupt of a change between structures where you might get some heightened wave activity going into that corner. So, if I'm looking at the bank and the stairs are coming toward mm -hmm. me, you would taper down this way. Literally, th th I'm not going to say throw. But Place some rocks under under the stairs. Under the stairs, so in, the front, of in front of the extends room. further east, but down in height. 
and in front of the bulkhead. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, against the um, existing That's slope. That's a suggestion, not on any vegetation, but you have some room. You're gonna go be going under the stairs anyway, but I would, <coughs> I would taper it down. Okay. Um, also, this would have to be cooperation with the neighbor, but between your house or your property and the neighbor's property, um, because you can't just propose to do stuff on your neighbor's land, um, you do have a gap between the bulkhead on the neighbor to the east and yours. I would suggest, if the commission sees it appropriate, that you work with the neighbor to bridge that gap because in the event of a major coastal storm where we get water up there, it's gonna funnel water in through that gap. Um, and that's something too that the commission, we had a, we had a project um, on Oyster Creek, actually, it's one of, was one of, Mar one of Mark's projects where the commission wanted activity to happen on a neighboring property and we just conditioned that we had to have permission from the neighbor to do such a thing. And that could work in this case as well. Um, I never like to see hard solutions go in because, you know, we, it's, it's, it's um, something you can't go back on and change. But it's, I think in this situation, it meets. We have a coastal bank here, so the performance standards are for storm damage prevention, flood control, and wildlife habitat. There really is no habitat here to speak of right now. So we would talk about storm damage prevention and flood control. And proposing what you're going to do with the sand nourishment and with an appropriate mitigation plan, which um, I feel the commission should at least see that plan and not because it's going to be a, a large enough area. This is a big project too, that the commission should see that plan, whether it's, I know you want to get going on this project, um, whether it's as a change in plan or an amendment or something like that to, um, but I do think the commission should, and my, um, you know, review a plan to a mitigation planting plan for this project. Um, but otherwise than that, I would recommend, I would recommend approval of the project. Thank you, Amy. Comments? Well, <coughs> my own, I don't really have a comment other than uh, in my career, I built a lot of these revetments and this looks pretty good to me. I don't see any anything wrong with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No comment. No comment. Jim. <coughs> no comment. I've got a few. Um, stepping back to DP's position on a project like this, the, the, he grandfathered. They view it as the, when the house was first constructed or the reconstructed house. They're they waver to be honest okay. on this. They used to at the beginning of my career um, they used to be very stringent and they said you have to have a wall or a chimney or you have to have some component of the pre-existing house um, present you don't have to have that anymore you have to have you have to have proof that a house was present prior to 78 but they have not been stringent yeah. um, and we don't see a lot of these here when in Harwich a lot of Harwich a lot of what has what is revetted has been for a very long time, so we don't see many new ones. But in my talking with my counterparts in other towns, I did ask them about this. Um, they said what they've seen, you know, highly eroding areas in other uh, La Truro, Wellfleet. That's how they're viewing it. I think distance to the house is important. To be viewed. And that's that 40 feet, right. and they're they're under that now. Okay, so I wanted to ask that. Uh, secondly. Um, this is a project that I would like to hear from the extension agent, um, the Sea Grant extension agent. They, they typically do review these projects for us. The reason I would want that is not so much whether um, so something is not needed here. I think something is needed here, but the idea of having um, the two-part, you know, the revetment and then a bulkhead, um, to get that opinion from, it would probably be Greg Berman, Mm -hmm. I think it would be very useful for me and maybe the other commission members. Um, getting some feedback from him on the alternative analysis where we, we don't see 
any soft solutions discussed. Um, it sounds like fiber rolls might not be the best approach here, given right. you've got the, the syrup right there. Yep. But I would expect that to be in the alternatives analysis. Another item is if you remove that, that jetty, would you reduce that, that storm flow coming in, that channel? Mm -hmm. Is that even a practical item to put in the alternative analysis? You want me to answer that now? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> that is complicated at best because yeah. we don't know where they came, we don't know who put them there or where they came from. Yeah. I can tell you at this point, because the jetties don't go all the way to the bank anymore, yeah. they're almost non functional. Right. They because they're channel too. They don't channel energy in there? A little bit. They, little might, bit. they might channel some energy. It gets bounced around and absorbed by the rocks like a revetment does. But when these groins function, more better if um, the slope, well, they're, they're breached right now because now the sand doesn't have to, now the sand isn't held by the groin anymore. It can just go landward and around it. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the groins come landward enough, they hold that sand and the idea is it's supposed to go out and around. Well, it doesn't do that anymore. That function is gone. And now any, any sand that's in that system just comes up and washes behind the groin. So you get kind of the same process, but the, the, what the groin was intended to do, uh, in my opinion, is very, very much diminished now. Mm -hmm. right. and, and do we even know if uh, 43 Shore Road owns the jetty? Is it, um, is it part of the property? I can tell if it, I could be, a, I could look and see if it was public or private. That's yeah. about the extent that I can check. If it was not owned, then you know, I don't think anybody would want to entertain Going Say again? I, if it's not owned by the property, I don't think anybody would really want to pursue removal as a potential solution. Right. I wouldn't think so. On the plan, there's a property line. That line right there? Yeah. That's the extent of, of this property. So in front, in front here is actually town property, but it's underwater. So that much of the groin half on this property and half on that one and then the rest of it um, well I don't know about this guy but mm -hmm. this portion of it would be uh, perhaps on town property that's actually that's town property yeah. it's not deeded to the property we don't it's not known yeah. not that I'm aware of I've gone back to the early 1900s to find licenses for certain groins when I know who owns the property and back in whenever this was put in, a lot of these groins were put in in the, in the 50s by the Army Corps, and some were put in privately, but it, it's almost impossible. I spent eight hours trying to find it on one, and I knew who owned it. <laughs> so it, it's just, it's not something I'm, I would recommend touching um, because it's not really functioning anymore. If it was all the way up and you wanted to remove it, then now you're talking about really changing the, the coastal processes that are going on there. But now, at this point, I don't think it has a whole lot of effect. And it, it will continue to trap the sand that's between the two groins, but in a storm, they're going to be underwater, and that sand's just going to freely travel along the beach at wherever it wants to go. Amy, do you think it's a reasonable request for the Sea Grant to give us a review on this in a timely manner? Um, I can certainly. Uh, Greg always does it um, mm -hmm. for us. If the commission would like Greg to review it, I'm more than happy to reach right. out. And the big issue and is as soon the, as possible. You know, what is the optimal structure? You know, I think um, at this location. And then um, my last comment is on the mitigation plan. I, I think I feel strongly that should be part of the public hearing and reviewed here and approved as, as with the notice of intent. Um, amendments can come later, but I, I think it should be part of the review. And if we do ask for this sea grant extension review, there'd be time to prepare True. that mitigation plan. That's all I have. Thank you. Stan. I don't have any additional comments. Sophia. So I have a question. Sure. Which is in the, was it December 23rd that the event happened? In that event, how much sand? What was the volume of sand that was removed from the bank? Do you have an estimate of that? Um, it's like 12 feet. calculate it pretty easily. I can calculate. It's easier for me to do that in AutoCAD than it is in my <laughs> head here. But I, in addition to the bank, the volume of the bank, um, 
two feet at the beach dropped at least two feet the entire beach because so so where I'm going with this is it's more than the what did you say 2.7 and 2.9 yards a year is the average over many years that's been removed from that well, that's three, by 3.2 from the coastal zone and remember right. that's an average it's right. a long-term average from mass coastal zone management it's not accurate anymore so I'm just my thought about this is this is a I mean this isn't like a a normal process here it's a very peaky thing that every now and then there are extreme events that remove a ton of sand mm -hmm. that appear to be happening a lot more frequently I'm just wondering whether that number whatever the number is three yards a year is a useful number and whether your suggestion that this, you know, the sand on the bank on the that you're proposing, the volume of sand, and I forget that number, which you say somewhere in your narrative will last 20 or 30 years or something, mm -hmm. that given this sort of event, that's not the way it's going to work because right. all it takes is one storm to basically wipe all that stuff out of there. Exactly. Probably. So given that observation, Does this whole plan work, I guess, is my question. I mean, if we're going to have another storm in two years or three years that does that, mm -hmm. which I would not be shocked at this point if that happened. Um, I mean, we had a storm, when, two weeks ago that maybe it wasn't as extreme as the December 23rd, but it wiped out a bunch of stuff. And, yeah. Um, the water certainly came up a lot higher than we thought it was going to. That much sand is going to be removed from a revetment like this on a regular basis, every few years maybe. Does this hold up? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're proposing that um, if the benchmark falls, or what are you calling a trigger point, um, if the sand, I mean, I don't know how those trigger points apply to that kind of regular extreme event where you're counting on there being sand built up behind the revetment up to the 10 or 12 feet height, and that when a storm happens, some of that will, or maybe all of it will get wiped out. So what do you do in that case? That 50 yards you're talking about, mm -hmm. you're going to dump that on there. And if that's happening every couple of years, uh, then you're going to be trucking tons of sand in there every few years to... Well, we don't, can I speak? Oh, yeah. I, we don't really have any choice at this point. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I, I, your point is a very good one, but um, had we known the kind of vulnerability that we were uh, buying into, and um, we, we never would have closed on the house. The only thing that I would say, I'm not an expert, but if you look along that shore, if you look along the, the beach beyond us, anyone who does have a revetment of sorts, they managed a heck of a lot better than we did in the in the aftermath of it. So I'm hoping that you know that's gonna be an answer for us going forward, that it, it won't be as detrimental or as catastrophic as what we experienced, you know, the day after mm -hmm. the, the storm. So Okay, so to address your, your question, that's the beauty of using trigger points. Because when they're reached, whether it's once a week or once every 10 years, as soon as that trigger point is reached, you put the sand back. So if nothing happens for 10 years, they don't have to do anything. If a major storm comes along and removes that sand, they have to put it right back. And it's as often as it needs to be done. So that's why the trigger point works really, really well, because the frequency is based on mother nature, not on any other factor than how, much that, how quickly that sand leaves, and then you put it back. And you know, it would be unfortunate if it was once or twice a year. It would be unfortunate if it was once a year. But as we've seen along shorelines like this, um, the National Seashore, for instance, that has a three foot per year um, erosion rate. Sometimes nothing happens. And other times, they'll lose 10 or 12 feet in one storm. So that's the beauty of the trigger point, is that it, it accommodates that natural event 
uh, whenever it occurs, and then you're allowed to do it when it's needed. So I, I hope that answers your question. Well, I, I, I guess given my lack of understanding of these processes, I agree with Brad and that it would be a good idea to have uh, a specialist from the county review this. Um, I also agree that we need a plan, a planting plan, a, a, a mitigation plan, something that is part of the term. I wasn't going to ask this because, I mean, I've seen that in other places where you don't have a revetment on the other side and it just goes around it. And I figured that it was far enough back where the normal water is, it wouldn't be a problem. But going back to what we were just talking about in a major storm, do you see that as a problem where it could still come right around and come in from the side? Well, <clears throat> that's why it's tapered when you, as you start to go up at that, right. that access, that's why it's tapered up. In my opinion, by the time the water gets up there, you know, this is really a lot happening. Right. Yeah, and it might even, it might even wipe out the access path before it does anything else. But again, the, the trigger point would then replace that sand um, right away. And because there's no time of year restrictions here either. And I saw a really cool nourishment project on, um, down in New Seabury yesterday, and they had a front end loader. You might appreciate this because your lawn will probably be okay. They had a front end loader loading this conveyor that was like 30 or 40 feet long, and it just pitched the sand at a high rate over the bank and down onto the mm -hmm. beach. It was awesome to watch. But um, my point is, is that that sand could be put in. We don't have NEPA, uh, we don't have national heritage, so there's no time of year restriction. So anytime this trigger point is reached, they should be able to put the sand um, right back over the, right back over the uh, rear bank. So, and um, Greg Bourbon just reviewed one of my projects. It was on Bass River in the Narrows. I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. that area, but that was an area that it was, <clears throat> was going to be a, um, and I'm just saying this because I know how he feels about fiber rolls in a, in a velocity zone, and it's, it's a no-go. It's a non-starter for both of us. But um, the commission was asking about a soft solution there because it's a pre-78 property and all similar conditions, except it's the narrows. And um, yeah, he says, he's like, no, fiber rolls won't stay here a minute. So he did not recommend that. Uh, but he did respond within two weeks. So there's a chance, I mean, for, we, for, I'll for all of us tomorrow. here, the sense of urgency is high. So we do want to. Based on your experiences, I don't know if you can answer this, but on this, based on this design, and I know all jobs are different, and everything in Mother Nature is different at times for everybody. On your experiences, based on this design, how successful has this been in the past on other properties? Any revetment that I've had installed, which has been the majority of them have been along North Shore and Dennis, and th those walls from Toe Stone to Elevation 22 are about 27 feet tall. If the right person does it, I've never had a call back in 23 years. Okay, yeah. and that's my point. Uh, my point is the applicants are in a need of urgency for this, and I don't see any other opinions needed other than the professionals that have brought this application to us based on, I mean, from the applicants' professionals. Um, I feel strong that based on that and personal knowledge and other folks in the town and communities and other areas, I have no problem with this plan, and I'd like to see it move forward as soon as possible for these people. Thank you. I agree with it. Okay. I have one question for Amy, which is, um, given that part of this plan is replenishment of sand, mm -hmm. is that something they would need to come back to us for additional permitting? No, or is it would be a, in the conditions. Right now, ongoing. Ongoing. We would talk about the trigger points. Uh, beach, you know, the beach profile levels and things like that. We had to put notification, probably have an annual monitoring just for somebody, a professional, to take a look at that and see if that's been reached. Um, that's all quite common. Yeah. And in a certificate of compliance, too. Right. So, no. Um, 
my previous town, I mean, annual maintenance was a regular for pretty much everybody on the shoreline um, because of the high erosion rates where I worked up in East Ham. So it can definitely be conditioned for an annual or an as needed nourishment. Some of the um, erosion control firms that are out there say that they'll, rather than going out at a specific time each year, which they could do, they sometimes they say that and or they'll go out after a significant storm event to take a look yeah. at it. So all of that can be handled in, in special conditions as you see fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we have no further discussion here, I just want to see if anyone else we have. Uh, okay. And I don't know if there's anyone online. Mark, I can't see the screen, so I can't see whether there are people. Uh, you have the floor first, though. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question. As you all know, there's. you identify a, yourself? Uh, Nancy O'Shea, uh, 11 Rabbit Run. There's an easement that's right next to that property that you guys are probably all aware of. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know how that would be affected by this. Um, I'm assuming we would get nourishment because we're having problems with our beach as well and that this project wouldn't do anything but enhance that because we've had issues before where we've tried fences yep. and mm -hmm. we've asked for nourishment as you guys probably were in excess of 10 or 15 years which you may not have known um, and was turned down every time so my question is this project which I hope you get done because I, I saw the damage. It looks like. I want to know how it affects the easement that we as neighbors use mm -hmm. um, and have really been put to the side when anything else comes up. Mm -hmm. So that's important to us. You want to answer that or you want me to answer? Sure. <laughs> well, I can say that the easement, so the, the sand that they're putting is on their property. Part of their property is what we have, what the town has an easement over. Um, the previous owners of this property do have a legal agreement with the town, and I don't know how this works, but they have an agreement with the town that there shall be no nourishment along that easement, on that easement. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. I haven't, I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney. It needs to be some, and I would like to see sand there too, but we need to, the town can ask the attorneys to determine whether or not that agreement is still active or not. And I know that the town wants to put sand there as well. So, but again, I'm not an attorney. There is a legal document and we have to explore that. Yep. I will. So in my opinion, and I'm not an attorney either as, you, as you're well aware, but in my opinion, the way that if there's, a, if there's some agreement in place that says the town can't place sand in a certain place, you know, that doesn't preclude the property owner from doing it. That agreement has nothing to do with the property owner. So in my opinion, the property owner has every right to put sand on their own property, which will only benefit that, mm -hmm. that easement and the use of it. So just to clarify, Amy, the legal agreement is about town property, not this property. Well, it's the property. easement. Well, the, the, easement. Town, the town does not own the property. It has an easement over it. The property owners on either side of this yeah. own to the middle of the easement. The town simply just has an easement. We do not own the property. Correct. It's 40 feet wide. Well, it's a paper, old paper road. What's this line then? Hmm? What's this heavy dock line? That's their. That's, that's, a, that's a Wesley property line. Yeah, and I don't know if that property line, if that's correct, Mark because they do own part way into the easement. I asked Dan about that. Okay. And, and he's the one who did the plan, and he's yeah. very familiar, so that's the way he put it okay. on the plan. But yes, they own to the, each owner, Center. each property owner owns to mm -hmm. the middle. Whether that was a, back in the day, maybe it was a way to water or something, I don't, I don't know, I don't know that. That's, mm -hmm. but it is clear from all of the research that's mm -hmm. been done that each owner owns to the middle, mm -hmm. and the town has the right to pass and repass over that property but so the bottom line is regardless of who uh, regardless of that mm -hmm. um, even if the town can't ever put sand there the property owner can mm -hmm. and which is a benefit to everybody mm -hmm. so but to clarify looking at this drawing in the context of this conversation the, the return on the 
the west end of the revetment goes outside of what appear to be the property lines here. So I'm, I'm confused, actually. Do the owners have the right to be building their revetment into, I don't, and I don't know who owns that property, and it doesn't look like that line goes through the middle of the easement. Based on the, the deed research I've done, they own to the middle. So, but so this um, line maybe it should be another line or not, but um, the the way the easement reads is that the townspeople of the town of Harwich shall be allowed to access the water, so and that the owners cannot prevent access to the water. They're not touching the path. It's all going to be landward of the path, the work that they're doing. So they're not preventing access of neighbors or townspeople from accessing the water by doing this. But I understand your, your question about maybe there can be a change to the plan of like center line of easement or I, I don't know. But it does, it does make it look like you don't own to the middle. I asked that question of Dan and um, if this helps, while it's a question, I, I just want to say that property rights aren't within our jurisdiction here. Mm -hmm. So while it's a question, it, it, it doesn't have to, um, just like you were, well, it's not. So we don't have to worry about that in regards to the, to the permit. Okay, sir. Yes, uh, Mark McGowan. I'm a neighbor uh, over in Rabbit Run. Um, I totally believe in you know, making sure that you get your property back and do what you can for that. My biggest thing, though, is that um, because the town has let us down um, and hasn't maintain the the beach next to it the public beach next to you uh, the case is, is that I'm concerned with adding the re the stone revetments have you done any study on the fact of what it's going to do to the next door neighbor which is the town beach so that's why we taper the returns okay. of these revetments. If I ended it abruptly, yep. then the water will come around behind and eat away at it. Okay. So by wrapping it around the corner, you continue to absorb that wave energy, and as you get higher and higher up toward the street, there's less and less revetment. So at some point, it's it's natural. But I mean, it'd be nice if the water never got up there. Yeah. But again, if it does, and if it takes sand, it gets put back on the revetment and, and washed back onto the access. You mentioned earlier about uh, the, the, the jetties going out, and I agree wholeheartedly, is that they're, they're useless now. Yeah. Is it a case that we need to add some back, in other words, so that, you know, to, to, to build a true jetty back, so that we wouldn't get the runaround? I thought about that. Mm -hmm. um, and you're the engineer, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, okay. I'm an ocean engineer by degree. But yeah, I, I okay. Yeah. It matters, but yeah. um, generally the only one in the room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Having said that, so I did think about that, and yes, they would, if we brought one or the other groin more landward, yeah. they would start to function. Yeah. But everything has its occurrences, so mm -hmm. if it does that, it's going to affect the downdrift beach, mm -hmm. and we're kind of not allowed to do that. So it's problematic in the way that we realize it's lost its function, mm -hmm. but if we fix it, then we change what's going on out there, which they don't like us to do. Mm -hmm. And the guy next door, we extended that groin all the way to the to the uh, bottom of the bank. Mm -hmm. um, it would be harder to traverse over it for public strolling, mm -hmm. but it would start to starve that beach, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they would not be happy about that. So well, this is it. I mean, it, it, it it's a catch as catch can. No it question is. about it. And the fact is, is that and and, and truly, I'm, I'm I'm in support. Anything you can do to add. That's a wonderful because we've been trying to get the town, as she just said, 15 years of pounding on their head and thing is they just let it go. Matter of fact, um, Brad Chase, um, your, your family was the one that gave the two prop pieces of property that we access for the beach. And the fact is, is that it's a shame. It's, a, it's an absolute shame that they, they, they gave this property to the town and the town didn't maintain it. They didn't maintain it like Grey Neck Beach or Earl or Pleasant. And the fact is, is that it, it's, it's, it is, it's a true shame. And the fact is, and the, the uh, gentleman that uh, owned the house before you uh, was, was quite uh, an interesting character. Uh, he actually fought the town so that he was trying to basically let nature take its course and strip 
that beach so that no one would come down and he wouldn't have to share, share the, uh, the, the shoreline. I mean, pretty pathetic. Um, but, um, yeah, well, no, it was. It let's, really was. Let's not disrespect. He's so. deceased. The oh, I, he's deceased. And, you know. Let's please not go there in this yeah. meeting. Yeah. yeah. It's well, yeah. I just, I, I, relevant. Yeah, well, it is relevant because the fact is, is that my concern is we're going to truly lose it all. We, we, we've, we've lost 90% of it. I mean, the fact is, is that at high tide, there is none, no beach at all. Um, the fact is, is that it, you've got to come at low tide uh, to uh, actually put a uh, towel on the beach. So there's one, there's one thing you guys might consider as a neighborhood, and since all of the private property owners have the right to put sand on their beach, mm -hmm. you can file for a, a joint nourishment program, and together, you know, you can maintain that beach. Maybe not all the way out where it was. You get a cut? Um, <laughs> well, I'm dead serious. All right. Well, okay. I'm just saying yeah. that... I'll the give you my cut. Effort is what really makes a difference. Okay, no, that being is to like throw in a shovel in the ocean. Yep. But together, there's a lot more, a lot more positive yeah. impact. Okay. So can, can okay. I'm now the uh, question, now, I, please. The last Sorry. question I have is timing. <laughs> um, the fact is, is that uh, we could you just send me your information? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the yes, get it done. Get it done. I, I just don't want to see this thing. You know, actually July fourth. You know. I mean, <laughs> You know, um, because uh, to have any enjoyment uh, and having, you know, all this going on. So I don't know. I mean, what, what, what is the timing? Does it, you know, do you talk to any of the contractors? Yeah. There's one company that normally has a, a stretch of open time in June and or July for that very reason, that people don't generally want equipment in front of their house then. So that's a, it's a, a starved time for them, so they would be ready to go right away. Completion date? In, the, in a perfect world, two to three weeks. Yeah, okay. okay. <clears throat> That's enough of this. Okay. I want to see whether there are others in the room who, unless you have other questions that are pertinent to the Excuse me, those were pertinent. The decisions we're making tonight, is there anyone else in the room who has any comments or questions? If not, is there someone online? Anyone? Okay. Take that gentleman there. Online. Sorry, online. This is John Tian. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, first and foremost, thank you to Vivian, Dennis, Mark, and the committee for uh, for allowing us to uh, to speak. This is John Tian and Laura Tian. We live at 44 Shore Road, directly across the street from the McGuire's new property. And uh, I just wanted to say, and we wanted to say, we're supportive of the project to allow them to um, protect their property. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to Dennis for taking the time this morning to speak to myself and Len Monfredo, who lives at 42 Shore Road directly across the street, to go over some of our questions and, uh, and concerns. And we just wanted to say that we support the project and did not send an email. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, do we have further discussion from the commission? Then, yes. Are we going to go ahead and ask for that uh, second opinion for review by the Sea Grant extension? I, I think there's no reason why we wouldn't want to, um, both from a design standpoint, the erosion rate question, and as well as the question for the, the nearby beach. Um, it's, a, it's a tool we've used again and again for mm -hmm. a long time. I, I have no idea why we wouldn't. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's standard, yeah. as well as a mitigation plan, which we don't have. Well, then you should make an, a motion to that effect, if well, that's I'll, what you feel. I'll make a motion that we continue oh. until... Um, uh, Our next meeting. The next meeting. Let's which, try it. Which is what date? Yeah. May 24th. Okay. I move we continue until May 24th to allow the proponent the time to uh, make these modifications to the application, as well as to reach out to Woods Hole Seeker. I'll reach out to Greg tomorrow. And I'll be happy to work with you on a, a, a plan. Mm -hmm. And can we agree tonight on how much uh, mitigation area you want? Was that, that official a motion? Was that, hang on. Yeah, hold on so one second. So there's a motion. Yeah, we need a second. Stan seconded it. Now we can have discussion. Yeah. Okay. The discussion is limited to the commission. It's not outside discussion. It's those voting. Um, so, 
commission can discuss how yeah. much mitigation so let's have you the would commission want. Discuss that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Perfect. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was wondering if it would also be helpful in addition to the two items that we have already mentioned, whether or not we could have town council look into the issue of the ability to nourish the beach. We can, but I don't think that should be hinged upon this yeah. meeting. That's a, I, I will definitely reach out to them ASAP or request from, I have to request from administration to use council so that I, I will do that. But I don't think that ultimately we should hold up, you know, this. if we don't have that in two weeks, I don't think we should hold this project up and we should move, we can continue to move forward with that conversation with council though. Okay, I can agree to that. Lee. Okay. So, I have an additional question on the timing. It, it seems given the impact of winter storms that um, I'm not sure it's that critical to get this done before July 1st, July 4th. Is the fall an mm -hmm. awful time? Uh, we get a hurricane, though. I mean, they're afraid of hurricanes. Yeah, really? Yeah. 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 ASAP. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chase, do you have a chance to swing by? I, I've been there before many times. Uh, the flagpole that used to have a fair amount of uh, embankment in front of mm -hmm. it, right. it's, it's close. I can see your concern. Uh, and, yeah. you know, our concern is both a safety concern the stairwell, you know, you know mm -hmm. when these things happen, you know, it can happen. It, it's not to the point it's going to collapse, right. but if we get a big storm in there, those things are coming down. Mm -hmm. And we're also trying to be, and this is not to suggest for a moment uh, that you, you know, that you have to just listen to me, but simply put, our concern was getting the work done so people can enjoy that area and they're not looking at construction work and boulders, you know, come the end of June. Right. And that was it. And of course, being August, you begin hurricane season. Do we have a lot of hurricanes in August? No, didn't we have Hurricane Bob back in the 90s? I remember that. Mm -hmm. and that was a big one. Yeah, you know, wild. so it does happen. Right. And my luck on this property <laughs> hasn't been good. <laughs> yeah. I wish I was never there. Yeah. It's worth asking, but, but truly, these coastal engineering structures require significant scrutiny from conservation commissions. And I, I'm not questioning that. So, we have a motion. In a second, we have not discussed the matter of area of mitigation. May so I make a suggestion? Please do. So part of mitigation is sand, would be some sand nourishment. Um, I would recommend a one-to-one -one for, so if your structure, new structure that you're putting in is 1,025 square feet, I would recommend that amount of mitigation um, on the property. That being said, we would typically ask for much more of somebody because you're in a resource area, um, which we usually require four to one mitigation for being in a resource area. So the fact that you're doing some sand as well, um, I think should count. And I also know that you don't have a lot of area to do it. Um, so I think we could see a net benefit. I think a thousand square feet would be a very big net benefit of um, native plantings along that top of bank. It's specifically more towards um, more towards the path, the southwest area, um, as well as in the front. But um, yeah, that would be my recommendation. So I keep asking questions. Go ahead. Um, so in terms of our regulations on mitigation, it, it is a, a water dependent structure, I think. It is not because it's not below mean high water. So it would kick in the four to one then. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's a coastal bank. But there's no room for that. So it's just no room. All right. So it's a creative solution. It, it's Try, yeah, yeah, trying to. Okay. Does in lieu fees kick in? Is that an option too? They could if you wanted to go there. Um, I think part of me was feeling that this it's not. I know that this doesn't play into a decision, but this isn't a want of somebody where a lot of things that come in front of us are somebody wants something. Somebody wants a bigger deck. Somebody wants a bigger house. Somebody wants a dock. This is a little different. It's reactionary and not something I don't think that you would, you don't want to have to do this. <laughs> so I know that that doesn't ultimately play into, in, in my mind, it's, it's just, it doesn't, there's no room for that in our regulations, but it plays a factor in my mind. I think hearing back from 
the extension agent on erosion rates, the trigger point, those type of things can be very important for us to consider. Okay. Can we give them the guidance to do a one-to-one? -one? I, I like your idea. I, I think it's worth putting on paper. Okay. I would just modify that with a request to the applicants to closely scrutinize their property and what can be done mm -hmm. and come back to us with, I mean, given that there's a gap here between one to one and four to one there's a big gap, th yeah. that's being proposed, I would request that you consider how you could increase that amount. I didn't look closely at the upland there, to, I, I don't have a take myself on mm -hmm. how much area there really is or what's on the area and what someone might consider they could do with it, but I would just request that you guys think about how you could do native plantings there, which in a way that would probably be very beneficial to you anyway um, to increase the amount of mitigation as much as it seems practicable. And we can be a little flexible. We typically require documents a week ahead of time. We can be a little flexible on that because of Greg's schedule as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, because okay. you, you might not get his report till the, the right before the meeting. Yep, yeah, the last one he did it was the day before. Thankfully. Yeah, so we can we can be flexible. I'll do my best. Okay, we I'm have happy to meet you out there too. A motion, a second. <coughs> do we have any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Opposed. Okay. Four to two. You're saying. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda are some orders of condition, <coughs> uh, starting with uh, the Wicks and Dock, right? Isn't that what that is? Yeah, 15, 15 Harbor Way. Way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any comments. I kept it fairly basic just because the, we referenced the plans and there's so many intricate notes on the plans that they have to follow. I didn't, didn't see it necessary to rehash it. Having an issue with Wi Fi. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 15 Harbor. Harbor Way. It only. Well. Which, which Wi Fi are you Town using? Town Hall Guest? Mm -hmm. Oh, here. You got it. That's okay. I wasn't here. I, I'm not going to know what happened, so I was just curious. Special condition. Okay. Someone want to make a motion? Before I make a motion, Mr. Sure. Chairman, 
Uh, if nobody has any questions on any of the others, do we want to take these as a group or do we want to take these individually? I'm fine with taking them as a group. I don't know if others care. But you just hold your motion until we go through them all? Well, yeah. you'd have to announce the other ones yeah. and then do okay. the motion. Okay. We, search, we don't do it often for orders, but I don't think it matters too much. So the other two uh, orders of conditions are 46 Indian Trail, map 34, parcel K3-2, SE32-2531 for a new single family dwelling and appurtenances, and the town of Harwich along Nantucket Sound, Herring River, Round Cove, Allen's Harbor, Witchmere Harbor, and Sacquatucket Harbor, SE32-2292, amend the scope to include beaches on private property, as amended. I did see one thing, I guess, on that one earlier, and there's, um, I'm trying to find it, there's a requirement to have an annual report to Natural Heritage. Uh, Which one is that? That's on the nourishment plan. That was a existing, that was a special condition that was there previously, so we can't change that. We're just looking at the amended. Okay. I just wasn't sure if- um, We do that though. Right, makes sense, but is there reporting to back to the town? Does, does, it, does the town well, receive we, a report too? Well, we make the report that we send to Heritage. Right, so, there's a, so the reporting comes to the Conservation Commission? We can share that with you. So we ask for other nourishment plans. As far as nourishment, natural heritage, what we're looking for nourishment is, so the reporting we have to do for heritage is really the um, piping plovers and the turns. So that's what we report. Yeah. So I guess I was looking for, you know, just a, I, an update on what happened. I can make sure we get that from John Rendon in the future about where sand went and how much. Yeah. We can do that. It seems like we should be consistent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, sure. But, it, but I don't know. I, I wasn't the hearing, so is it appropriate to request that at this point? Well, Brad, you're not requesting a change in the order of conditions. Mm -hmm. You're just asking an administrative question of Amy. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think, I mean, John gets those reports because he is, you know, he's in charge of the dredge operations. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he wouldn't mind sharing them. It's right. not they something we talked at the meeting, record. so I don't think yeah, we can put it. Be. So, okay. So report where sand goes and how much. All right. So are we going to do it all as a group then? Sure, people are ready. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> just then I will there make three. Indian Trail. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I wasn't here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll make a motion that we close the public hearings and uh, authorize the issuing of the order of conditions on the following matters. One, Town of Harwich, 15 Harbor Way, Map 1, Parcel H2, SE32-2532. Number two, 46 Indian Trail, map 34, parcel K3-2, uh, SE32-2531. And number three, town of Harwich, along Nantucket Sound, Herring River, Round Cove, Allen Harbor, Wedgemere Harbor, and Sacquatucket Harbor. SE 32-2292. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Okay, so next on the agenda. There is somebody online for this if you have any questions, but, sorry, go ahead. So it's a request for a certificate of compliance.
for the Eversource Energy location at 25 Lothrop Ave, map 12, parcel A1, SE 32-2515 for an after the fact permit for a pole installation project. It also included um, additional gravel area and um, little disturbance to the wetland itself. Um, the commission permitted it. They did install a low timber wall around the new gravel area, which is what we suggested as some sort of low profile wall to keep the stone from eroding into the wetland. And they did this. Um, so I would recommend a certificate of compliance. Anybody have questions? I took a look at it. It looks good. They did a good job down there. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay, we have a motion. Okay, I'll move that uh, we uh, approve the certificate of compliance for 25 Lothrop Avenue, map 12, parcel A1, SE 32 2515. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Not opposed? Six zero. Okay, so <clears throat> we have discussion, possible vote for two items the Herring River study request for proposals and Bell's Neck land management plan. Can I make a suggestion? Please do. So I'm in the process of compiling the comments that we've gotten for the Herring River study. And we actually just got one more in. It was from Rachel Hutchinson, who is the new shellfish specialist with Barnstable County. I haven't had a chance to look into that yet. I'd like to have more chance to compile so I can give you a hopefully final draft with all these comments addressed. And I have not had a chance to do that. Um, we have a, and same thing with Bell's Neck Land Management Plan. I'd like to have some more time to, and I know we've had a lot of time, um, but we have a light agenda next time, lighter than tonight, actually. Um, so I either propose that we do a separate meeting to talk about those items, or that we dedicate, we de let's say we're going to do those at the next meeting. Um, I know I have some more availability coming up. We have an, our new person has started, um, and she's great. She's taking, you know, a little time to um, acclimate. So, um, unless you're prepared to discuss more tonight. Thoughts? Anyone? I'm happy to wait until next month. I hate putting it off. I just haven't been able to. I have comments. Okay. So Greg Berman and Tara Lewis reviewed the Harry River study yeah. mm -hmm. and very good comments. Mm -hmm. I think most of these comments can be addressed pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So number one, do you want me to do that or do you want to assimilate? Because I, I'm not going to say no to you doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of them are pretty technical. Yeah. I mean, so, but there's two that I want to have an open discussion tonight. Sure. I don't take very long. That's fine. Uh, Bruce Berman brought up, and again, I think most of these comments are really good technical things to adjust quickly and track changes so next hearing we can see this. Uh, my thought is probably to try to nail out the, the study for next hearing and get it done. Mm -hmm. Doing both in one night is, is a fair amount. So maybe we tackle one at a time. Do a separate meeting for Bell's Neck? Either that or do it at, at another hearing and, okay. and maybe have discussion. But I almost think the Herring River study is closer to being it is. ready to go. So my, my point... Um, Bruce Byrne brought up the point of access. Greg? Sorry, yeah, sorry, Greg. <laughs> I, I, call, I, I know another Bruce Byrne in Boston, that's what it is. And uh, so he's concerned about a contractor's access. My thought is he's a title into the Commonwealth. That's what I thought I too. I don't know why we can't get access to this. Still do our due diligence and approach the property. Oh, owners. absolutely. But I, I'm not so concerned about his comment but I wanted to put that out there that was the only one that I thought was I saw that yeah but you think you agree I will I agree with you I mean we notify the, the we notify the people on the river yeah but if they're launching from our town you know the launch on the Herring River and they're not going on to these people's docks they're staying in you know yeah. they're just staying in the waterway 
it is Commonwealth Tidelands, we will still notify them. Right. Yep. And, and give them just transparency about Absolutely. What, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think I'm fine with that. I think everyone else is. And the one comment from Tara Lewis was on the sample design, the sample size, mm -hmm. she wanted to boost it from a 20 dock assessment to a 30. I, I looked at Google Earth and I counted them all, because I think in the footprint, I only got 37. I was like, there's only about 30 something <laughs> there. Yeah. So I, I don't, I She think, may not be familiar with that. So, but she had really good comments on sample size and design, yeah. so I still want to incorporate her thoughts, but I just want to let you guys know that um, we may have to go random design or selective design. And I suggested random to avoid possible conflicts of sending people towards difficult dogs. But that's, I think you have to do one or the other, is just have either random or select it and tell them what to go for. Yeah, I saw those comments too. It's hard because it's, you don't want to direct them. But on the other hand, I, under, I, I also see the issue with a truly random yeah. sample as well. So I see their, con their point. Yeah. So I'm not a specialist in experiment design and a statistic. I know statistics, but not, you know, in a different context. Um, but my reaction is that the sample size is so small, just the overall set of samples, that I don't see why you just don't use, use them all unless there's a cost issue. That is, you know, taking a subset of 20 out of 37, mm -hmm. it's very different than, like, in the shellfish sampling thing, where you can't, you can't sample a full 10,000 square feet. So you take 1% and assume that that's a representative sample if you take enough, you know, if there's enough samples there. But 20 out of 37, it just, it, it seems, um, I'm just not sure it's, it's reasonable. And I don't, I'm not sure why you wouldn't just take data on all of them. And if you need to randomize things for some reason, then you randomize, once you've taken that data, you take random samples out of the data you have for the whole set. Mm -hmm. Got questions over here? Yeah, John, I agree with you completely. And that gets us out of the problem of whether we're directing to certain docs or we're having them do just random. Because and it also, I think, adds validity to the, stu the study. Because if we only do a sample of 20, no matter how, you know, how above board that 20 are selected, there are going to be people who are going to ac accuse yeah. the study yeah. of having selected right. ones yeah, exactly. that have a problem. Mm -hmm. By doing all 37, we get ourselves completely out of that problem. Mm -hmm. And you can randomize that by averaging over a bunch of small subsets yeah. of taking samples, uh, taking 10 samples out of your 37 and doing that a whole bunch of times. Yeah. And that's your way of randomizing them. Yeah, yeah I agree 100% with John. Mr. Chen. Alan. Um, just a question. So a few weeks ago, months ago, I had that same question or concern that Greg brought up about access. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple questions. How do you handle a property owner when you notify him and he doesn't want to give you access? First of all, I guess I should back that up. Who owns the docks and the structures? They own, they own the structures. So they own the pylons and whatever board material goes to it. Navigationally, people can go up and down in a boat. And go up right alongside that dock. And just sit there and look at it. Mm -hmm. Can't get on it, mm -hmm. technically, because it's not their property. You, you, I, you can, actually. I hate to interrupt, but... Uh, oh, public, you can yeah, go over. Chapter 91 says yeah. it, it, the public can reverse over the docks. It's so Over though, they can't like sit on. Yeah, they can't like mm -hmm. Sunday dog. <laughs> but I, it's I, a means of getting out of an emergency kind of situation. No, you, you could to, to get access. This, you know, the boathouse on the western side of, of the Herring River. Yeah. Um, you can go right over that. Yeah. And, and I do to go shell fishing sometimes. There's a sign right there that says you you know public access allowed for yeah. Chapter 91. And that's kind of weird because you're going over the guy's lawn, but because the, the boathouse is so big, that's all you can yeah. do. And that, that's the law. So I, I think you want to be very sensitive to private property owners' wishes. And that's where I'm trying to yeah. go is that because I think 
as I think Jim said, if you don't do all 37 of them, you're going to be, people are going to say, well, what's going on? Why are you picking mine? And, and what's, you're looking for some faults. And, you know, how do you compare mm -hmm. that to everything up and down the river? So mm -hmm. I, I'm very conscious of people's property rights. And that's all so I'm going to say. In, go ahead. Okay, yeah, no, I would just like to raise a legal concept, which was in the planning board and in that area, the town had the absolute right to traverse over somebody's private property in order to do any types of surveys necessary for the planning board's activity. Now, I wonder if being another regulatory entity of the town of Harwich, there may be an argument that we could rely on a similar type of right to cross over somebody's property to undertake the legitimate activities of the Conservation Commission. Uh, Amy, that may be something that <laughs> if you could get access to town council, you may want to ask town council. But Jim, yes. unless I'm misunderstanding here, nobody's proposing that going on to somebody's dock is a necessary part of this work. And I don't see how from a, a, an owner's point of view, this is any different from maybe two years ago when we got uh, John Randone to take us out and go up right. and down the Herring River and I took like two or three hundred photographs of every dock and all that and you know the scrutiny is is more detailed here but yeah. in terms of you know property rights how is this any different? John maybe I misunderstood what the access issue was. I was assuming the access issue is when they're doing their surveys they park their truck on the street, they walk over somebody's property down to the water where the dock is located to do whatever sampling that they need to do. That's a really good point because uh, an average citizen wouldn't have that right to go across the private Correct. property. That's what I'm talking about. Although you can, go, you can go along the entire stretch and go shellfish. So well, wouldn't the study be from the water? The what? study may be from the water, Amy, but yeah. how they actually do it and how they access the water, unless they're going to do everything by boat, mm -hmm. I would envision that they would have vehicles, whether they be trucks or vans or whatever, that may be parking on the street, and somebody would have to walk across somebody's property to get down to where the dock is. They may even use drones. They yeah, may. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't envisioning... I mean, them going know, on people's lawn, you know, crossing their properties. Yeah, that's too difficult. I, I think that probably wasn't going to touch that. Can <laughs> cross private property for shellfish matters. Yeah, we can well, go think, on, but I think just in the notification, that should be really clearly uh, stated mm -hmm. what we right. the activity that's going to be taking place, mm -hmm. so that we're prepared for any rebuttals or any kind of thing. And furthermore, that it's clearly stated in the RFP, so nobody who reads the RFP doesn't understand. Yeah. Uh, doesn't Study to be conduct decide conducted that via their water. property rights are going to be violated. Right. So, yeah. I mean, we just don't. That's a good point. We don't need to raise anybody's alarm about no. anything that's going on. We, we could also direct this to be done in the off season. Maybe if we have the time, maybe want to say after Labor Day. Oh. That was my other question. When is the best time for this study? It, it depends on the metrics. If you want peak growth season, then you want summer summer and early fall yeah so I'll have to think about that I I do think they need to measure the docks and so they have to make measurements so that has to happen um, that's I think chapter 91 does well we have a lot of that data yeah I don't think that, I think it's all permission I think going across the private property to access the sites is problematic but yeah. direct them to a boat you know that's probably the best way um, the, the reason why I scaled it back to 20 sites was costs. I, I felt like it might be a lot to have people gather data on all these sites, but let's just see what the we can see. Back. You know, and I'm I'm, all, I'm focused on randomization. That's what I do for my job, and so I'm always randomizing everything. And so you can say, what would the cost be to do 20 sites versus well, all up to 37? 30, up to 30. Was yeah. A, you know, it. Yeah. 37 includes all the way up to the North Road. So right. Well, then um, if you give me that third review 
Yep. I'll, I'll get it to you guys, you know, well in advance of the next meeting, and then it would be a case to just look at the track changes and uh, putting it all together. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of the other one, I, I almost think you need a little more time. If we could knock out one and then tackle the I'm next. happy with that. Yeah. I felt bad not having much to. No, the other one's big. There's a lot going on there. There's, there's a lot of assignments. I think, Sophia, you want to take on something? I know I was going to take on a table, maybe the invasive plants or something. I forget. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think there was, there was a few different tasks that were coming up. And yeah. So maybe knock out the study and then tackle that plan. Okay. We don't have minutes. So I have a request relative to minutes. Um, but first, a question. The minutes listed here, which were January 4th, is that the most, fur most furthest, furthest back? Yes, we are caught up to that point. Can I request that you prioritize minutes for the most recent meeting? That's, I was actually going to try to take enough copious notes so I could hopefully, on a short-ish meeting like this, so I could bang out the minutes. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe Go back. for yeah. Alicia, if, if that's going to be her that's job, fine. that her following current meetings yep. as opposed to something True. five yep, months ago, and that. then for the second set. Trying to work backwards. Trying to uh, start from the furthest back and move up. So then we end up with a history of current minutes. I would really like to see us having. I agree current minutes. Melissa got us very close. She got us close and, but and, and you've had a hard few weeks, but it's okay. Um, that would be my request. And um, for next yeah, meeting, do try to hit this meeting. That's, that was my goal. I, so I mentioned it to her before I left. I said, I really think I'd like to take as many notes as I can so I don't have to watch the tape so much so I can bang out the minutes myself. Um, Thanks to town meeting, come July 1st, we have the ability to have a part-time administrative assistant as well. Um, so we're not gonna be tied to the office, tied to the permits, tied to you know all the paperwork and the emails and phone calls as much and minutes. Um, that is gonna be the new person's job. So, right. yeah. So, but right. I mean, that might take a little while. We have to talk about it internally about, I mean, I want to advertise tomorrow for that, but we're not there yet. <laughs> we're going to be sharing the position with the building department, so. Nice, congrats. Yeah, it'll be a huge help to actually get it back out in the field more, so. Yeah, exactly. So yes, point well taken. We can make that happen. Great, thank you. One item of new business, just real quick. Yes, uh, sir. Food for thought. The town of Mashpee, if they're town here, did you hear what they did with their buffer zone? Yeah. yeah they voted to expand it. Mm -hmm. To how far? I think 25 feet. An additional 25 feet, yeah. Uh, uh, have you ever heard that in Massachusetts before? Chatham, Chatham. did something very um, similar, to, or in, in, in a similar scale. Yeah. Um, so they also adopted. It? What was the buffer? It was very similar to ours. Yeah, so that's 75 now. So it's 25 on top of the no disturbed 0 to 50. That's what I heard. I haven't seen it, but that's what I heard. They are, ex are they extending the 100 feet as well, 225? I, I thought they were doing 25 on top of the 100, but I... I don't know about that. Yeah. Either way, I think it's food for thought. We, we've talked about, um, you know, bylaw changes, wetlands changes. Um, that would be a, a vigorous discussion, I think. They also adopted um, more, you know, floodplain regulations, but before the state or the county has come out with model bylaws, so which is interesting. I've been hesitant to touch that until we at least have some guidance from the state or the county on it, but Mashby just did it. Yeah. So what was their argument in town, in town meeting? I, I was surprised by a short argument in the Cape Cod Times, so I can't uh, tell you. I think um, hmm. they, they must have a commission that felt um, they weren't holding the line on some, I would think, new construction. And I, I kind of feel the same way in the town of Harwich. I, I think you wouldn't want to see that for a 
grandfather project, so just in Yeah, it was for new. It was for new. Yeah, I, I think for new construction it might make sense. Uh -huh. Maybe for specific resource areas, maybe for not all resource areas. I think that was the case too. Yeah. I think the development environment is pretty different in Ashby than it is here anyway. Huh? Yeah, but you need two little folks to make it work. Yeah. But it did it pass. Yep. Okay. Any other new business? I sent you all an email about a interesting new educational event at one of the Boston Harbor Islands. It's free. So we're planning on going. It's about different solutions to assist with erosion and um, natural solutions to assist with erosions. They're using, we don't use it here because we don't have but well, we have some cobble beaches on the um, bay side, but um, we don't have a lot of cobble beaches, but they've been creating more cobble beaches to slow down the erosion. And they have some other methods too, so it's coming up in June. I sent you an email, I can send it again, but we're probably, a lot of agents in the area are gonna go. Um, people are interested, it's free. I sent you the link, you can sign up. Free. It is free. That boat ride to Lovell's Island is beautiful. And they give you lunch. Yeah, that's you should pay fifty bucks for that trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had one more. The, the bottle bill, we talked about the bottle bill, writing a letter to the state or something for the legislation to enhance or try to support the bottle bill. Yeah. The nips. Oh the but nips? The yeah. Well, we should probably put that on at some point in the agenda to support that. So remind me. I, I'm the sorry. trash uh, event you had or something, you were talking about people donating their time to pick up the trash and the litter. Yep. Most of the litter is uh, nip bottles, plastic bottles, this and that, and there's no recyclables on them. And so if we could That's support nice a recyclable deposit. bill, deposit so that people will be deposit encouraged on. to pick up. And oh, so the proposal is a deposit on nip bottles. Well, whatever that is isn't well, a deposit. A few years ago, there was a, a question on the ballot, like for water bottles, <coughs> plastic water bottles. Down. I mean, rather than banning things, I think that having a proponent of recycling to encourage more incentive to keep them not I mean, in. Yeah, put them back. Yeah. It has a deposit on the water bottle. Yeah. Right. If but we could do anything as a commission, that's all I'm saying. So, but you're suggesting writing a letter oh. to the relevant state agency. Amy suggested it. I, I, we I'm talked sorry. about it that she could write a letter. Or the group could write a letter. The group could write a letter. <laughs> okay. I don't know what that letter is, but we talked about that. I'll do a little research. That's actually good. I can. Misha might enjoy that doing that too. Oh, there you go. I, it sounds like a good idea to me. I'm huh? just trying to clarify. Yeah, I know what you mean. What the action is here. Usually we support a support a letter. Given uh, process <laughs> underway. Yeah. Hearing mutterings of it, but I, don't, I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Would you entertain a motion? As long as it's entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I move to adjourn. And I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Signatures here.